You're listening to the Slavic Literature Pod, your shelf help guide to all things Slavic. I'm Matt Garasimovich, PhD candidate at Northwestern University, studying Russian literature and film. And I'm Cameron Lalana, a literature enthusiast and guy working in media. We're two friends who met studying in Russia. We like talking about books so much that we made it into a podcast. And this podcast is the podcast for people who want to learn more about Slavic literature, art, and culture. Every episode, we're going to be bringing you the background and analysis you'll need to know and understand these works. If you're interested in supporting us, you can head on over to our website, slaviclitpod.com. All right, Matt, what are we getting into this week? This week, we are on part I've lost track of Vasily Grossman's Life in Fate. We're going through books two and three, chapters 51 through 18. Uh, I've lost track what part we are on in our internal series number. Uh, I've lost track what month of the year it is. Uh, I haven't talked to my friends or family since we started the series. Yeah, well, on the bright side, we only have another month and a half before we can see our friends and family again. Um, they've been sending me messages begging to know where I am, but uh, I, I thought it was really before important. Before Vasily I... Grossman returns me from my, hostage, my own hostage crisis. Just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's he, exactly he's it. He's keeping us. He won't let us go. No, he's got an old, uh, he's got the book over our heads, and he's given us a pen, and he says, you're going to write. It's the responsibility of a storyteller to tell the truth. Uh, I've done my part. Now you guys have to do yours. And we say, hey, we don't have, we got like, we've got like a few thousand listeners, man. You could shoot higher. And he said, nope, you're the only podcast who does this. You're my only choice. Choice. It's a lot of responsibility, quite frankly. Yeah. But we bear it with grace and dignity. And we have not once yep. ever complained about this. Uh, Correct. About our burden. Correct. Correct. <laughs> yeah. And that's what counts. <laughs> that is what counts. And speaking of having a great burden that never, you never once complain about. Uh, let's talk about let's talk about <laughs> books two and three. This is a uh, uh, compared to the last episode where we were bouncing all over the place. Every four chapters was a new section. This one's a lot more straightforward. We only have like five major story arcs through this part, uh, mostly because we're for the most part, other than finishing up our conversation on Victor's time in Moscow that we started in our last big episode. Uh, most of this part has to do with the, the counterattack in Stalingrad, the encirclement of uh, Paulus's 6th Army. Finally. Finally. We are, just, we, are, we are one book in 600 pages into a series about Stalingrad, and finally, <laughs> the main part of the battle has happened. Yeah, we're about, what, 1,400 pages if you read Stalingrad into yeah. this, all things considered. So that's perfect. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's in... Yeah. I, I know the plot points of this whole series, but every when going through this, I am continually surprised at the order in which these plot points are introduced, because there's some things you think, ah, oh, this is going to be way bigger, and then you go back through and you're like, ah, oh, this happens in the last hundred pages, I see. Mm. <laughs> so, Grossman keeping well, us on our toes. At least this part was fairly, I, I, yeah, I want to say straightforward, but in terms of chapter sequencing, th- things more or less are, are sequenced how you would expect. There's not a lot of cutting in between perspectives and and whatnot so it's a pretty straightforward in that sense uh on this part yeah but or at this point i mean maybe it's not maybe just when i was taking notes i just cut those ones out from my <laughs> own notes to, to to make sense uh, no i can tell you i haven't I haven't doing the roundup on all the arcs in this part it, it is pretty straightforward okay well then remember what i said first <laughs> yeah. Go back to and, that. and speaking of those arcs let's go ahead and quickly cover the arcs we'll be talking about in this part as a general reminder if you want a more in-depth look at any given chapter you can look to our daily episodes so we're finishing out like i said with victor's time in moscow his arguments with his boss shishikov his issues with his family ludmilla remains pretty traumatized over the death of her son and nadia's out trying to carve out her own life which her parents try to get on her about before remembering huh i guess we did do the same thing when we were her age huh uh, not that that entirely stops him, and not that that's entirely stopped any parent in history, I think. Following that, we go over to Durensky on the step, who is having a hell of a time with lice, a uh, bit of loneliness, and what exactly does it mean to be a warrior, sort of, uh, before being assigned to Novikov's tank corps, 
Uh, before we dive into the city of Stalingrad itself, where Stepan Spiridonov, after being called the hero for keeping the power generators running, the factory going for as long as he did, decides uh, to leave less than 24 hours um, before the counterattack happens, cementing himself not as a hero, but as a coward going forward. At the same time, his daughter Vera gives birth uh, to her in Viktorov's son, has some thoughts about that as she is on a barge which has been turned into a hospital uh, before we go over to find out that Viktorov has been killed in battle. Second to last, Krimov is arrested and goes through the delightful experience of being taken to the Lubyanka, meeting some other prisoners, uh, and getting along with them very well. Before finally the actual counterattack in Stalingrad happens, mostly from Novikov's perspective, but we also dip into, towards the end, uh, some of the general perspectives from soldiers on the ground, uh, from Stalin, from Hitler, from Troikov. Uh, it's, it's a big roundup of all the big important people, um, although maybe, as the text might suggest, depending on your reading, they are less meaningful than those nameless many who fought the battle themselves. Is there anywhere you'd like to begin? Maybe we should start at the top and finish out Victor's, uh, Victor's section here. Yeah, I think we may as well. I feel like that's the, the best way to go about it. Because I actually think that the Victor chapter here, the end of it, kind of gets into something that is discussed towards the end of this part of our internal sequencing. Uh, and, and this is a part that is pretty important as far as the novel goes. Probably one of the primary things that the novel is is kind of concerned with. And that is, of course, anti-Semitism. And I think that when we historically look back at the Nazis, we can say, yeah, they were bad because they did this, this, and this. Um, and, and, and anti-Semitism being one of the, the, the primary things that we look back at and say, hey, this was not good. And it kind of what Grossman describes here is how that starts to really influence and really infiltrate Soviet society, especially in the very high circles of government. And there is this line that we can get to a little later, but kind of, he's very critical of this because, of course, he's writing this uh, with that kind of hindsight of a few decades after the war and the way that the Soviets then scapegoat Jews for all sorts of, all sorts of different things and in Grossman himself. Uh, we haven't gotten to this point yet, but th there's going to be... V Victor's storyline is not done. He's got a very interesting one coming up, I think. But this part as, as a whole is kind of the, the anti-science chapter. I feel like Victor has given us a lot of his... We, we've gotten a lot of these thoughts on, on what science is, and we've talked about how it might be kind of analogous to the anachronon of farming chapters with Levin, and there's this great discussion on, on freedom in science and, and exploration and uh, a number of wonderful things. And none of that ends up mattering because the authorities start to prop up or enable or encourage rather some of the people from the Slav Brotherhood, which is a, a group that, that privileges people who are of Slavic descent uh, above, above all. and. There are people in these very high-level meetings talking about how, uh, you know, Victor's work, uh, to quote, stinks of Judaism, and that Grevich only called it a classic because you're a Jew, and the authorities just gave a quiet smile of approval. And so it, it's, it's just interesting that we, we kind of have this, this bridge of evil uh, that, that connects these two systems, and, and looking at how that kind of gets transferred from one to another when it becomes convenient for the Soviets to uh, either purport themselves as liberators or when they decide, mm, we need a scapegoat, so, uh, you know, now we're going to start pushing you out. Yeah, and I think that's, it's an interesting bridge to build, too, because it, it uh, as you, we understand as readers, this hasn't come out of nowhere throughout this entire book. We've seen this sort of... Um, the sort of chauvinism on the part of mostly the the ethnic Russian characters, um, and not that every character has it, but there is a there is a thorough like a through line there of that being tolerated or even kind of accepted 
uh, because you have people like, for example, Getmanov, when he kind of browbeats Novikov to appoint more Russians into the officer um, officer roles in and the tank corps for no better reason than because, well, you know, we're fighting and dying for all these, you know, all, all these other nationalities in the USSR. So why are they overrepresented in the officer corps? Which, of course, I, the implication of the text is they <laughs> certainly are not. But we're I, I think this is an important feature of of Grossman where it's not um, the the mechanics of these um, of, of these bigotries are something that he is interested in pursuing, not just talking about how he, the government utilizes it, but how does how does it come into these places? Right. Um, I think we understand it pretty well on the side of the fascist forces. And that's why outside of some periods with, you know, in earlier chapters, Bach and uh, with the commander uh, list or list, excuse me, um, that we touch on it lightly, but more so, I think a lot of groundwork has been placed throughout this novel um, with characters like Getmanov, or there's another uh, character in the academy who I forget uh, what his name is, but everyone knows that he's sort of like a Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, okay. He's a kind of a racist, but he's old. He's been there forever. We can't do anything about that, obviously. Um, and you know, Victor is like, kind of, yeah. Everyone's on my side about this. We all recognize that this guy is kind of unhinged. But then he finds out that on the side, people hang out with this guy and go to his parties without ever telling Victor. So there is a you know a tacit acceptance of these attitudes. Um, not even just like, okay, well that's how it is. But even sometimes, uh, maybe I think as the text suggests, a, a sort of a mild approval, right? Like even if. That may be an idea that some of these other characters might not express themselves. It's certainly not one that they're ready to tamp down on or they kind of seem to exchange like knowing smiles around Victor sometimes uh, on these topics. So with the the taking up of this this anti-Semitism, even at this early stages, right, it's sort of the um, this as, as Victor will term it, the sort of like the the. How do I phrase this? Well, the Slav Brotherhood, right? There's the this reactionary force that continues to exist throughout the, the whole of the Soviet Union, right? I mean, there's so many... This is a, in a, a long-running conflict between, traditionally, a lot of the socialist uh, ideas that come from the revolution are quite progressive in, in a social sense. But as the Soviet Union moves on, I think this is an important feature to talk about. There is a sharp turn towards conservatism and i think sometimes that 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 those political terms don't always make sense to people in terms of talking about the soviet union but there is like you know there's a sharp turn towards more traditional gender roles traditional forms of art right like this is something that the the especially by the 40s and 50s they they are deep in the the sort of freewheeling 20s and early 30s are in terms of artistry in terms of new forms of relationships feminist um uh, feminist reorganizations of society. There are legacies of it for sure, but this is something that's f long fallen away and these more kind of conservative social attitudes really reasserting themselves, which, you know, in one form you can see in this, um, not in, in what was a tacit acceptance of anti-Semitism now being allowed to assert itself into policy um, with, with more than a little approval from others around them. Yeah, and one of the things that Victor's really concerned about in this chapter is the way that it is sort of carried out without really mm, being made explicit. And one of the ways that they do this is through a, a survey, more or less, that he's asked to fill out a, a report on his on his heritage and where he comes from and what his family did before the revolution. And he has this thought to himself that, to me, a distinction based on social origin seems legitimate and moral, but the Germans obviously consider a distinction based on nationality to be equal, equally moral. And this is, a, you know, an interesting one, because on the one hand, of course, the Soviets, they do do this. This is something that is, is very big in Soviet society. If you come from... Uh, a bourgeois background, you're probably not in a super high level of government, or you may be treated as politically suspect from time to time. You know, like it, it's a, it's really it's it was a big deal at at a certain point. Um, what's being done here is is of course it, it, the implication seems to be that they're 
uh, removing Jews from high levels of science, of academic life, of various institutions of importance. And, uh, you know, I don't know the, you know, whatever their internal logic is, but uh, of course, Victor's dealing with things that are probably considered state secrets. I mean, super high level science that has to do with nuclear programs. And so this is something that, you know, it's, it's used as almost a cover to do this. Oh, well, Victor comes from a certain background, so we can kind of uh, snub him and remove him from his post, or we can do this or that. And you have you have the infinite guise of of social background, but uh, Vic, Victor's quote is still well well taken here. It's something that you know again in another another bridge between these two systems on, on some of their approaches. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And it I feel like that, that's such an interesting one too because it can be one that can the conflation between those two things, especially in the context of World War Two, uh, could be seen as crass. I think, but I think Grossman pulls it off well in the context of the all the questions he's asking in that chapter as as the form this questionnaire is trying to fit him into a very small box which victor on, on basically every front doesn't feel he can answer down to the point where <laughs> the forum is like are you a man or a woman and victor's like a oh, man but oh this has been this my manhood has been taken from me by by impotence in society um which you know a lot of that goes down to victor's uh, own um neuroses and and fears and anxieties but i think it's pretty clear for most of the chapter um these are not simply um personal neuroses but real questions to ask to the state about this attempt to reduce um, a human being down to a couple of data points which this entire novel is an attempt to reject that view of are you sure grossman's not pro gpt uh well you know it's a whole it's a it's a brave new world who knows maybe Victor, <laughs> maybe uh maybe our good friend uh, vasily grossman would say hey you know what's even better than my war reporting chat gpt generating a live feed which we broadcast to soldiers at all times mm. it's all about content baby i think that's what mm-hmm. vasily grossman would say probably a big content guy <laughs> it's all about well, content. i also like the way that then uh he's upset with the way that his daughter Nadia is looking at him as he's trying to scold her and and talking about the way that the way that she looks at him is kind of similar to how Shishikov, the you know, the head of their department, looks at him. Just this way that they have just this air of indifference about them and that you know, it's almost this patient indifference, sort of where where Victor is really you, you know, he's not really that important in, in the lives of Either his daughter or the state. Uh, he's just kind of there, right? He, he's performing some of his duties, but he, in the eyes of the state, uh, I, I think they think that they can just replace him. And in the eyes of his teenage daughter, well, obviously, uh, he, he's replaceable and, and, and not, not really someone that's, that's necessary at this moment in her life. More of a hindrance, right? And I, I just love the way that... Uh, uh, this this particular scene kind of connects those two things and i think it's also uh it's a good reminder of i think it's it's good to have the periodic reminders that victor's a little bit of a ridiculous person and especially his own approach to parenting uh in in his brief realization and and funnily enough the the one of the few moments in which he and ludmilla seem to have a moment of connection is kind of remembering their own impotence in regards to trying to rein in their daughter uh, as they recall, huh, yeah, we were like that at her age, weren't we? Um, although not dissuading as them. As they go on to tell her that they didn't do that at her age. <laughs> right. <laughs> but that's like, that's again, that's one of those things that um, I, I think for, for sometimes for readers, it can be difficult to hold these, these contrasting views of, or this, this multifaceted person in mind where Victor is simultaneously right, uh, deeply full of neuroses, ridiculous, um and you know still kind of worthy of respect all these things are all happening at once um not the best father like all these things are wrapped in one package same is true for Ludmilla I, I that's just I think I've said it before I'll say it again the way in which uh Grossman can capture a multifaceted character so well um in in especially I think the ways in which characters in different aspects of their lives can show such different faces depending on their comfort level um is can be hard to hard to capture I don't feel like i see it that often done so well as in as in this case 
the the victor of the lab and the victor of the of the home being so different yet so obviously connected from the, from the same core yeah and you know regard well I, I feel like with his parenting he's kind of like role playing right? i don't really <laughs> think of him as as much of a parent it's just kind of like it, it, these are almost like comic relief chapters when you are reminded that oh yes he does have a human being that he's responsible for <laughs> theoretically uh, and, speaking and theoretically speaking right uh, well, i guess he's also responsible to his wife but he's He's not very good at that either. No, no. As, no. as his interactions with um, oh, I forget uh, Sokolov's wife's name. Well, soon. Mm. <laughs> well, we'll get there when we get there. Yeah, I feel like we should move on to the step. Let's talk about the step. It's important to always or the front, I guess. The front step towards the towards the front, but still on the Kalmuk step. Yeah. My first bullet point is sand winky face. <laughs> that was a good bullet point. I think that's an important one yeah. to bring up. Right. It's tough. I mean, right. the men, it's coarse. It's rough. Of course. Gets yeah. everywhere. Gets everywhere. Yeah. And winky that, face. That winky, winky, winky <laughs> face. And that's an, that's an important one because uh, they, this, this sand, which is rough and coarse and gets everywhere, seems to have smoothed their brains to the point they no longer want anything but a bath and maybe some different food. Um, <laughs> which i think we talked about it before but it does touch on uh just the, the monotony of just the the hurry up and wait of so much that is so much of war <laughs> um i think you know getting to especially in other depictions of stalingrad not that like grossman is the only person to capture all of its facets it's so easy to talk about it and and focus on the big things right you you turn on the well uh, let's say the history channel circa 2005 i won't i won't make that claim for today and you start watching any given program at least when i was growing up watching them and they'd all be about warfare they'd all be about battles uh you know iwo jima d-day all these big important ones and grossman having been on the front lines i think is well aware that most of the war is waiting around for something to happen uh, which is what we spend frankly most of our time with soldiers in this novel just kind of waiting for something to happen Durensky up to this point has been his entire point in this novel has been to wander around and go to meetings. Yeah. Um, well, actually, everyone in the book, if you were to describe what they do, for the most part, it's waiting around for something. There's an exceptional amount of waiting around shown in this book. And I think that makes for a very anxious group of people, quite frankly. Even Victor, whose concerns are suddenly becoming very dire. But for, you know, a lot of the book compared to being on, on the front, you would probably describe mo most of his work was, you know, comparatively easier. It was desk lab work versus, you know, starving and shooting at people. Uh, you know, suddenly it takes on a whole new sense of anxiety where he is constantly just waiting for the other shoe to drop at work. Like, you know, all of the resources around him are slowly being stripped away. His support, his appointments that he puts up are being turned down. His staff is not being brought back to, uh, or placed where they need to be. And so it's just this, it, you know, the whole third part of this book, it just feels like we have our, we're holding our breath, waiting for that other shoe to drop. And I think that that's basically what uh, being in the step uh, has felt like for most of this book. And eventually there is some action, but so much of it has been just not not exactly just waiting, but, you know, doing those small sort of tiny, I don't want to say ordinary tasks, but more everyday type tasks uh, in the way that those kind of just fill and suck time from people uh, like picking off lice and like thinking about what you're going to eat. Uh, the, Things like this are, th there's a lot of this in this part of the book. And by virtue of them being deprived of the actual war to focus on, and I think something we'll explore more uh, in kind of like the last chapter or the second to last chapter we'll be covering with Trukov's reaction and Grossman's talk about his legacy, there is, and in his legacy, it becomes clear that Stalingrad, for basically everyone, this is true for Hitler and Stalin, true too, where it has gone so far beyond what the actual battle represents. It means so much to everyone. Um, and absent that battle, 
they kind of are almost lesser people for it. It almost seems to raise a new sort of consciousness in people. But here, these soldiers are not in Stalingrad. In fact, they're barely even thinking about Stalingrad. And they could, this gives us a lot of time to explore uh, a lot, many other themes about the, the work. Um, like a brief, brief conversation on the home front, right, of these two soldiers who uh, are complaining about their wives or girlfriends, not really understanding the front. Um, and yet reconciling to that fact, reconciling that uh, they themselves are, have not had the toughest experience out here on the front either, or at least not as much as they portray themselves as, um, talking about their place as warriors or, you know, talking, getting sort of that same sort of myth-busting about heroism where Dorensky's thinking about the the same moon as in the sky overlooking great, you know, Persian hosts marching into, into Greece, Prince Igor going into battle, so many other momentous battles, of which this is one. Not that they realize it and looking around and saying, that, you know, where are the warriors of those ages, these myths? And he looks around and all he sees is young, young, young people, young soldiers, young recruits fighting and dying. And as the recruits themselves say, not not warriors, but little sparrows. Um, and so this this whole space is just a good time to explore a lot of these themes, which otherwise the battle kind of overrides and puts to the side. Yeah, it's. um it it's a good depiction of, of warfare, I think, it, and it's 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 similar to me to the way that Tolstoy describes a lot of the sitting around in war and peace. There's a lot of important things that happen during that, and a lot of important interactions that happen not just during the battles themselves. And I think that that's partially what this book is about, which is not those intense moments of action that will make up the documentaries that we see on TV forever and ever, but all of the circumstances that surround them, all of the undepictable things. And I think that's something that he's able to do really well in the novel. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think um, the, the, in terms of depiction of warfare, I, I'm so interested, like you say, there's very little actual combat. There's people who are experiencing what warfare is like, right? You have these soldiers who are out in the steppe who are just, occasionally they get bombed. That's just something that happens to them. Um, but we very rarely actually, if ever, I think, um, you know, there's some parts with in, in House 6 1, but not a lot besides that, where you're actually experiencing combat with the soldiers. I think it's interesting that a lot of the combat focuses around the run up to combat, the decisions made into entering it in, in terms of Novikov. And the reaction afterward, and um, I think that that's interesting to the the themes that he he's focusing on, especially like the idea of heroism in battle. Compare this against um, Viktor Nekrasov's um, frontline Stalingrad, where you have I think a, a similarly a, a depiction of Stalingrad, which is you know not entirely in line with sort of the rah rah Soviet experience. It, it basically is, but it's also pretty you know, pretty day-to-day depiction of what it was like to be there. Um, and, you know, a lot of the heroism is in, you know, a, a, you know, a charge across the, towards the enemy line, something very brave and dangerous, whereas in here, I'd say the most heroic act of battle is Novikov choosing to ignore an order from Stalin to charge in order to save lives. And so what is emphasized here is not just like a, a, a heroism in death, but a heroism preserving life, which I find very interesting. Yeah, and yeah, I think in the in the face of such large amounts of death in this period, the, the ability that anyone could save any life, no matter how small, is kind of amazing. Okay, I think this is a good time for a break. We'll be back in just a second. This episode is brought to you by you, our listeners. You can support independent podcasting by heading to our website, slaviclitpod.com. You'll get access to the notes we use to make this episode, including links to all secondary sources mentioned. If you want to support the show but don't want to spend any of your hard-earned doubloons, you can join our email list for free at slaviclitpod.com, or you can leave us a nice review wherever you get your podcasts questions comments want to appear on our office hours podcasts drop us a line you can reach our voicemail at 209-800-3944 or you can also email us a voice recording or text question at slaviclippod at gmail.com or bring your question onto the podcast and do our best to address it all right let's get back to the show well speaking of people saving their own life <laughs> you beat me to it uh Stefan- spiridonov spiridonov Oof. big l for him yeah that's 
that, that wasn't a good, a great choice. No. Well, you know, it, that's one of those things where, as Grossman depicts well, there are often choices in which the rational one is not the correct choice. And that is some of the, one of the difficult things about, about living in the time and the place in which they do, in which the right choice is not is often not clear. And more often than not, it's the right choice is chosen by logics that are entirely beyond uh, these characters and are certainly out of their mindset. Whereas Spiridona looks around and sees a factory in which there are no workers. There is exactly one guy left, uh, Pavel... Uh, Andropov? I forget his last name. Um, there's exactly one worker left. And there's no more function at the factory. There's nothing you can do by staying here. So he decides to leave to go see his daughter. A personal logic, which makes complete sense. Uh, but by the greater logic of the need for heroes, of the need for people who stood up without ever faltering, a perfect hero. And that's why a dead hero is the best hero. Um, he loses out on that, on that status of, of heroism, which is conferred freely as long as you are perfectly in line with what you with these greater logics, which are not always clear. <laughs> yeah, this one was uh, just just one of those instances that go to show how many cases of life are decided by just incidental circumstance, right? Where, yeah, like obviously he doesn't know that he only had to hang on. 24 more hours that's part of the the calculus to to decide to leave but it, among this and many other chapters there's just this overwhelming sense of of randomness really this uncontrollable force that is is driving so much of life and you know to some degree we can we can choose with or against it but uh ultimately it's it is out of our hands and what tends to be a bigger force in Soviet society, it seems, is just perception, which has been something that stood out to me in this chunk of the reading. And the the thing that is driving so much of these people people's lives is just how they are perceived by other people in society. Uh, Spiridonov has fulfilled his obligation. I would say he's been working in the factory. You know exceptionally well practically to the last minute and past the last functioning minute as we said yet the the perception is that he is a deserter he's no worse than a traitor uh and, and that's that's going to be unfortunate for him yeah and i this is a bit of a later thing but bringing it forward to, to choikov at the very end where where we have this moment of victory and everything is so beautiful for a moment um and the narrator tells us let us put aside what comes next let us put aside his drunkenness let us put aside these embarrassing incidents um we have a, a sort of a, a how do i phrase it this i i feel like i don't know if i've talked about this idea of heroism too much and how easily it's conferred or taken away too but it also does um it 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 reinforces right how, how much this system of this idea just also strips away the humanity of people that uh, whether or not he is a hero depends on whether or not he does this strange action which is not clear to him and is mostly self sacrificing for no apparent reason um, whereas you know the other generals get to keep that status of heroism uh, which even though they may have sort of ruined it for themselves a little later on the state kind of they're of a, of a level which the state kind of covers for them because at a certain you know the other, other thing the the next step down from a dead hero is a, a high-ranking hero because well uh, that's a pretty good figurehead and so so what if you have to cover up some indiscretions sometimes so what if you have to cover up or not to mention too often <laughs> choikov getting drunk and attacking another member of the soviet because he seemed to get favored all of these elements continuing to i think support the underlying one of the underlying points of this novel in which this sort of valorization without remembering the actual humanity is essentially an empty concept it doesn't it doesn't reflect anything about reality it doesn't allow the fullness of people right even in that that discussion of shoikov it's not like a condemnation of his actions it's a call to let us remember kind of the best in him right so there is this very reconciliatory 
attitude towards the fact that people will fall down and fail and sometimes in deeply embarrassing ways and still giving them a sort of a grace in terms of understanding what they can do. Understanding that the, the same Troikov who does this deeply embarrassing thing at a ceremony can also be the same Troikov who um, is essential to the Battle of Stalingrad. True for many other characters as well. You could give any other number of examples of characters who are deeply embarrassing and yet very important in their lives, in the lives of their state, in the lives of their families, in the well, lives all of their of friends. Them are deeply embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> at one point or another, quite frankly. Yeah, right. Which is, you know, allowable to the human condition, right? If you're not allowed yep. to be embarrassing, then, well, you know, what are you allowed to be? What else can you be <laughs> if not embarrassing? The only possibility for the human condition is embarrassment. True. Very true. <laughs> Very true to my experience. <laughs> um, yeah, but this, I, I, I don't want to say like this is an affirmation of the human experience, but it kind of is, right? With uh, even though uh, it's very ends very poorly at first upon Spiridonov, um, we also at the same time he does this to go look after his daughter, and so hey, maybe it's he loses face in society, but um, the 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 child uh, brings everyone. A sort of comfort. I won't say just flat out comfort, right? Because they smile and they cry. And as the text says, they cry for themselves and smile for the baby. Um, so the place of continuing on the society is a one of some measure of comfort, but also a reminder of how much this war is taken away from people. So it's, it's much less compared to, I think, Stalingrad, where it's a pretty uncomplicated. This world is one worth bringing a child into. This one is... At, that was a pretty brave act to bring the child into this world because I don't know if it was worth it. And that's maybe it's less, I know this world is worth it, but I believe this world could be worth it. So I'm going to make that gamble. And that's, I think, when one person says you should have a medal for, <laughs> for that kind of faith, for that kind of gamble. Um, you know, maybe we should, it's, it's sort of a joke and also <laughs> maybe, maybe should be taken seriously. Well, I mean, speaking of Vera, I think that's that could be one of the bravest things of novel, hmm. quite frankly. Right. Well, it's more oh. brave to, you know, take that to say, I have faith that it, it could turn out well when things are still unclear than I think in Stalingrad where it's, no, it will turn out well. And I think there's, there's mm -hmm. something sort of brave about that, that leap of faith. Yeah, I mean, because so far since having the child, I don't know if i'm misremembering anything but i can't really think of anything good that has happened to her or them or just generally in the world at this point at this point um you know in the you know it hasn't been a, a super long period of time in the novel but uh it, it's not the not not the best time for sure when she's worried about whether her baby will remember being bombarded and you know the fire and the sadness and the, the grief all around yeah she still does it she still does it she still does it not to keep bringing up the Sistine madonna forever but i might um that you know, again like many other archetypes that we, we see this this sort of parent and child mopped in mother and child even if it's not literally their child but um th there are other circumstances this this parent and child relationship of one of suffering and yet the like the essential core of the human condition that um of course if things were always great and you kept on the human human lineage that'd be awesome that's fine that's fantastic but it's not really true to the human experience the human experience um at least reflected through this era is mostly one of suffering and um and and difficulty so when grossman is valorizing this sort of parent child relationship as one that is i think enduring right it's it's multifaceted. You've got, it's not, I think you can extrapolate it from just the kind of religious tones of Madonna and Babe, but also into um, this, this sort of dual relationship of you've got the parent, usually the Madonna, who is one enduring great suffering and yet still continuing to take care of this child of, of this future. Whereas we also have this child who sets forth some sort of promise forward. That um, although things are not good, although that suffering is great, humanity itself and what is human and man can endure as long as this continues happening. Um, and I think that that's why you have it's just it's it's very real. It's not 
two parents, right? In almost every circumstance, it's it's one single parent because it's um, broken down to like the very bare essentials of what this, this humanity is. It's down to the just the lineage itself, the the sufferer and the promise for what's to become. And because every life has been so difficult, there's very little else around them. No other family, no other friends, just endurance. And that may not be true for every era, but I think that's a particularly potent symbol for this particular era when the idea of loss and suffering, but potential hope may ring a lot truer to people than a more uh, hopeful depiction, let's say. And I think that image is especially pushed to the front when you consider how many men die during World War II. Uh, especially on the Eastern Front. And we have that model again being shown to us here as Viktorov will not will not return to our story after he dies. And then there is this very poetic description of his body laying on a hill at night covered with snow. The The stars are above it. The hill turns pink. And then the wind picks up and the snow covers his body. And just a very beautiful, poetic, sad way to end uh, part two of the novel. But it does thrust this this image uh, forward, I think, uh, especially more so, uh, knowing that, that Viktorov will not be in the picture going forward. Yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a recurring theme that we see in a lot of the emotional heights of this book. Um, but I think, and I think the two as highs being um, David and Sophie Leventon's death in the gas chamber, and here this the the Madonna and Babe who assert human suffering even in the face, or assert human strength and endurance even in the face of certain destruction, and also Madonna and Babe who assert sort of that continued lineage, um, but in the face of great suffering, ending on Victorov's death, like you say. And I think that's I, I agree with your characterization. Short answer. Yeah, it's a it's a very interesting way to like I said, end this this book on this note of or this part, I guess rather, the, on this note of sacrifice, and a sacrifice that is you know we it's questionably necessary, right? It's not it's certainly not valorized. He gets a sort of a death as part of a report spoken from someone to someone else. It's not this glorified battle scene by any means. And by the end of the night, his body's covered in snow. And so I think we had uh, one Discord user kind of, you know, liking this this metaphor of of sort of return, quite literally, back to your to your mother country, to to its earth, to uh, you know, have the future generations build upon that sacrifice, which is a nice and optimistic way of reading it. Unfortunately, part three doesn't start. <laughs> yeah, that was an excellent setup for the transition. <laughs> yeah, they kind of write themselves. <laughs> I guess they, they kind of did, uh, considering the, the choice to put these two together. Um, yeah, so Krimov gets arrested. Uh, Novikov, uh, unknowingly. Getmanov, this, this, this little guy weaving through the tail, just causing chaos for everyone else. Wandering through, getting people arrested. Um, I this is uh, this is I think one of my favorite parts of the book just to hear the Czechist, the old Menshevik. Uh, I think there's whether Bogolayev, I forget what his role is, and um, Krimov just debating uh, about life. I, it was, <laughs> which also I think this this part uh, before we get to any uh, really much analysis has the one of my favorite lines from this entire book. The concept of personal innocence is a hangover from the Middle Ages. Pure superstition. Tolstoy declared that no one in the world is guilty. We Czechists have put forward a more advanced thesis. No one in the world is innocent. Um, that was hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> that might be one of the best lines from this whole book for me. Yeah, that was, that was probably one of the funniest lines from this book. <laughs> it's not really that funny. No. Uh, grand scheme, but... Uh... At that moment, it was right, it, it, and it's funny in a very, in a way, in a very dark humor sort of sense. In a sort of you, you didn't have to be there. You probably shouldn't have been there, kind of. Yeah, <laughs> funnier if you weren't there. Yeah, right. Um, I think we talked a lot about this in the daily episodes, but this this section yeah. for me is so interesting 
in terms of showing the logics of um, the NKVD, because I think for on one hand, for us readers in a non you know post Soviet uh, modern context, uh, the idea of why the NKVD did what it did can seem really uh, illogical if you don't understand the deeply weird logics that it was operating under. And I think this is a good reminder to people. And it's a good, it was a good depiction for people at the time who wouldn't have been familiar with why things go the way they do. Because they make their own sort of sense. They just have a deeply weird logic, uh, which we only really get to understand through the old Czechist, Katznil and Bogen. Cameras a check is confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I promise it makes sense. No, it, it well, it's it you know it's it's operating its own set of logics, right? We have we know in the context of 1937 that uh, in in the context of Bogen, there is a need to find guilt, um, and that supersedes any evidence they have. So through you know, little bits and pieces from Katznellenbogen where he says, basically, help them find a ju- help them find a judgment for you, help them find your crime, because then you get to choose what crime you you committed. Right? We're understanding the this this system, which seems to lack all logic, is one that is maybe not based in reality, but has its own deeply strange logics. But at the same time, I think there's there's the ability to uh, to kind of reject that too, right? I think drilling. This is something that's this whole chapter that sticks out to me is this whole time drilling the old Menshevik and Katznellenbogen are refusing to basically ever talk to each other. With the only major interaction being the time being when Katznellenbogen has a heart attack or some sort of medical issue, and drilling is the only person who calls the guards to help him and goes out of his way to potentially. It's unclear if he survives or not, but at least try and save his life. Um, and uh, so throughout this whole piece, I think drilling. Not like that he's exactly like Ikonikov, but once again, you've got this character s- sitting there. You've got people advocating for what they have and people advocating against and, and the little little people in between who are just poking holes and says, is that really true? Right? Is it? Is it really... Do you really have the power you do, you, you checkist? Yeah. My, my favorite part on this was all the gossip, personally. Right. I'm, re- I'm really into gossip transmission. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's also very important. Well, it's not that deep of a thought. It's just a funny thought to me because this whole time Kremov is, he, he doesn't really understand how he's even gotten there. And th- this is just another funny sort of, in a certain way, <laughs> uh, aspect of the Soviet system, which is that for a system that's so, you know, so bureaucratic, so official, so strict that so many people got it, got uh, were imprisoned, were killed because of gossip. And there's this line that says, talking about Krimov, he had learned a little from wives of friends who had traveled to camps in order to visit their husbands. But all of this had been gossip, mere tittle-tattle. Nothing like this had ever happened to Krimov. <laughs> 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 not, no, not really, still not comprehending that there is uh, a line that, the, I, I think the, the implication is the line of gossip is when he was bragging to Zhenya that his article was commented on by Trotsky saying that it was pure marble, and then Zhenya bragging about Krimov to Novikov says about the Trotsky pure marble article, and then uh, Novikov saying that to Getmanov, and then Getmanov ultimately uh, turning him in. And all of it comes up very naturally in conversation from one to another. So I don't. I don't know if that's a hundred percent it, but that's that was my my understanding of it. Yeah, right. And it's it's so funny that you have this this almost I don't know if I call it a contradiction. I'll call it an apparent contradiction between the system, which is so bureaucratic, so heavily interested in trying to make everything fit into its box, as we saw earlier with Victor, and yet it still continues to operate under, like you say, the system of gossip of person to person information transmission, which is. Not the only case. This is true for many features of the Soviet Union. It's true for many features of every society. Um, between its self-image, it's, it's and like actual. if the if it's like if the local elementary school cafeteria also had the power to put people. To death. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's basically what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> that would be that'd be a hell of a show idea. Um, yeah, 
And at the same time, this uh, another feature here is uh, we say it again and again, but this this push towards humanizing others. And Krimov has very low empathy, and he, through up to this point, has never really thought about his own. He's only ever thought about his actions through the lens of its political significance. And it's in these moments, even though it does only relate to the fact that it's happening to him, he does start to say, huh. I wonder about that guy I sentenced to a penal battalion. Where did he go? How long did he last? I wonder about this person I sentenced to death and begins to think about the, the, you know, the family members of all those people in the same way that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very, a lot of the interrogation also covers the indignity of this. And I think um, that's something that uh, is probably an important point to note about the interrogation is sort of the importance of human dignity too, because it's, it's weirdly, it's almost embarrassing for Krimov to be interrogated like this. Like, hey, don't you guys care that I'm a human being? That I have, I've carried my friends, uh, I've carried my friends' bodies as a pallbearer. That I've helped other people, and of course, that's all irrelevant to them. And he begins to realize that that is also how he's treated others his whole life. That is how so many people in this system have treated others and depriving them of their humanity. Not nearly to the same degree as the the fascist forces in the death camps, uh, but it. it kind of seems like it's the same tendency, this desire to um, subordinate oneself to the state and allow their inhumanities to others to be justified by that fact so they don't have to think about a maybe a responsibility to another human being, to think of them as a human being. Yeah, they're really uh, not seen like that <laughs> in, in, in these chapters. And so I guess the... That there's that contradiction then where, you know, the Soviets want to be viewed as, as liberators, as fighting for freedom, and, well, just look at what's going on on the home front. And I think that that's why Grossman chooses to start part three with this scene specifically, because it's something that has not been reconciled by any means yet. It's one of the major issues of, of the novel, and... It, it probably is like the major issue of the novel for him, you know, writing, especially like we talked about in with some hindsight, I think that this is something that he wants to draw some attention to and say, Hey, if you can't push, you can't just push this aside just because you happen to be at war. Right. Yeah. And that's something that you see. So see, so, um, so I have to like take it out of the novel, the context, context of the novel too much, but you know, even in conversations now, I, I have, heard everything from the ends of the earth being justified because it's wartime, right? Things will happen. These are things you have to accept. And I think it, it, it feels weird to say it's a radical point to say no, but I think it's only radical if you don't apply it to your own context, your own time, to your own country's military and doing those things. And you talk to people in your own society and say, hey, maybe this shouldn't be allowable, even if it is wartime. Uh, and then that becomes a pretty controversial point. So I, I, I maintain that I think this is still provocative. It's not provocative in the context that it is in his own time anymore because so we're so removed. But to, to apply it to your own time, to your own conflict, and suddenly that becomes a real controversial point again. Uh, so another one of those provocative points from this novel, uh, which requires you to, to really think about it in your own context. And I think that's something that I've been thinking a lot about in, um, with this book, um, especially in, I forget which chapter it's in, in, in the latter part of this, um, of part three, or of, of the chapters we're covering, where Grossman says, or the narrator says, right, Tolstoy is a great thinker of his own time, a great analyst of, of what he was going through. However, as with all great thinkers, they are people of their time, and they analyze their own time. And so we shouldn't kowtow, we shouldn't completely, you know, put ourselves under their ideas, under their wills. We have to have our own thoughts. And I think that's something that I've been thinking about with Grossman, is to not just let these thoughts sit as... um moral morality tales for its time for its place but to really take these same questions and apply them to our own time and realize how provocative a lot of them really are even if they don't seem that way because of the virtue of being so far in the past yeah i think that's the great a great takeaway of of this novel uh is is that really morality doesn't really change but uh the situations that we often question it in do no, speaking of uh, our one morally upstanding character from this part. <laughs> oh, Novikov. Novikov. Yes, that's right. Yeah, um, I feel like we covered it like, pretty thoroughly in the daily episodes. I don't know if there's much more to say other than 
right? Like our conversation about this this insistence that we remember the humanity in people. Novikov is one of the few who has asserted that, the only one who has asserted that to such a to such degree, to such a point of self potential self sacrifice. It seems to be the clearest example, right? I str- struggle to find any other ones just off the top of my head. Uh, this is definitely a big one where he is waiting before sending his his tanks into the breach and uh, everyone's kind of breathing down his neck and he might end up getting denounced because of it but as as the narrator says there's there's one right even more important than the right to send men to their death without thinking the right to think twice before you send men to their death novikov carried out this responsibility to the full i like that yeah me too and not that there are any like perfect characters in this book, because there absolutely are not. But I think for a character who is as as heavily flawed as Novikov, it's important that this perhaps one of the greatest moments of heroism this novel is given to such a deeply imperfect character, uh, reinforcing that these these features are not of are not inherent to people who are inherently better or good or just uh, more than the rest of us. Everyone has their moments, high and low. And it's, it's, we have the freedom to choose those things. Yeah, I think that's uh, kind of the more radical point, is that we do have the freedom to choose that, whether we are going to do good or bad. Yeah. And for, for once, it's nice to see there's some good here. Yeah, and especially to this, this point, which I think is, exists also in, in, at the same time where Grossman also has spent so much this novel trying to say, if you didn't understand, right, like not only, it's not just you have the freedom to choose, but understand how deeply um, controlling the system can be, how little power you can feel you can have, and having great sympathy for people who are swept under by it. Most people are swept under by it. Um, Grossman at times in his life was swept under by it. There is a great amount of empathy for those people, and at the same time, it, it, he still says, or this novel continues to reinforce, you still can have that choice. It's understandable if you don't take it, but you do still have that choice. And like you say, I think that makes it a very provocative one. Yeah, it's kind of a, I don't know, it's a very redemptive message, right? That, yeah, you, I mean, no, no matter how much bad you do, even, you still, from moment to moment, have the ability to do good. and the bad doesn't wipe out the good and vice versa. They both just kind of coexist, uh, which is, is challenging. Uh, but this is a, I don't know. It's a very, very positive moment in this last third of the book. Yeah. Right. And I feel like we, we, we have that a, a couple times. I've talked about it. I'm just going to skip ahead just for a moment here. Um, but like, that's also after the encirclement happens and we join Choykov and Gurov and, uh, another general to talk about that victory the there is a this moment of silence which the narrator says basically like this is the true um this was the true people's victory at the war um the silence when the guns stopped firing and it's not about memorials or ceremonies or all this pompous things that i think Grossman has very little respect for but he does have a great respect and it's apparent throughout this novel for the individual's human cost to fight this war and the victory being a sense of peace the victory being that the fascist forces are not encroaching further, not continuing their their spree of murder and destruction and rape uh, and all of these things, and that is the that is the victory. And it's a low one. It's a it's one of we're merely stopping it. It's not these these high heroic ceremonial things, but that makes it all the more important that it's not that this silence, this sort of victory, is not the one that's um, valorized. And so with Choykov and Gurov, you know they. There is, uh, the, the narrator says, is there any need to continue this glory? Is there any need to describe the pitiful spectacle, pitiful spectacle many of these generals made of themselves? The constant drunkenness, the bitter disputes over the sharing out of the glory, how a drunken Troikov leapt on Redimtsev and tried to strangle him at a victory celebration merely because Nikita Khrushchev had thrown his arms around Redimtsev and kissed him without so much as a glance at Troikov. There is only one truth. There cannot be two truths. It is hard to live with no truth, with scraps of truth, with a half truth. A partial truth is no truth at all. Let the wonderful silence of that night be the truth, the whole truth. Let us remember the good in these men. Let us remember their great achievements. Um, so, like again, like you say, this very redemptive view of people, which allows and understands that they're going to fail and may fail more than they succeed, but to kind of hold up the possibility of 
of that greatness. Yeah, it's a, uh, you know, it's sort of, it's a nice message to, for that part to end on. And just that, I, I don't know. I think that that's, uh, I, I don't have necessarily a deeper point on that, really. Just that it's it's a nice point that this part kind of ends on. And yes, we do understand that humans are, are infinitely complex, but th- there's a certain point in this conflict where just remembering this this goodness and just letting that goodness kind of exist and having us appreciate it for, for a moment, that's okay. Right. And I think also extending it out to everyone, right, where we have following this chapter, the moment of some, several soldiers just enjoying the silence, and the narrator says, you know, they were enjoying this victory, a victory won by the same hands that strokes, stroked the hair of their children, fondled their women, broken bread, and rolled tobacco and scraps of new, newspaper. They experienced all this with extra, extraordinary clarity. Um, reinforcing, too, this, it's not just the generals, the officers, it's everyone involved. This is who this victory comes from. This people's victory comes from all of them together. Yeah, talk about a people's victory. I mean, vodka, bread, onions, tobacco. I know. That's the recipe for it right there. <laughs> I feel, yeah, I feel like it's most of what I want to talk about today. I guess there's also the, the elephant in the room is Hitler and Stalin. We've talked about a lot in our daily episodes and the idea of, of great men in history. I feel like I think our daily episodes cover that pretty well. Since we're getting the longer side, I don't know if there's anything you want to wrap up here in this big episode for the, for the, for the two of them and their interconnection I, I didn't like these parts <laughs> that's the, the uh the enduring the enduring reaction yeah i uh i do talk about it more in in, in the dailies i sort of I, I think it might make sense in a broader grossman logic but i think the psychologizing of the, the world leaders is a little weird here uh i don't think it's accurate or true in probably any sense maybe he knows better than me i mean he does on a lot of things uh, but I thought that these two scenes, they, they work interesting kind of as a mirror to one another, but I don't think that they necessarily, I think, I, I don't know. I don't know that it, that, uh, I, I just don't know that I believe that either of them felt guilty about what they did. Yeah. I, I do think, I agree with you on the, the psychologization is uh, kind of a weakness of this part. I think there is an interesting conversation we have between their views on their own strength being tied to the strength of the nation, which is tied to the ability of that nation to uh, enact its will upon others and counteract those other nations' wills. Uh, however, I think that that conversation ultimately is less important than the end of chapter 18, where these soldiers sit there quietly eating their bread, drinking their vodka, um, and knowing that this victory has come at their hands. And I think that that is really where... Um, it, the importance of it lies that Grossman does psychologize these two a little bit and and has a lot to say about their own strength, but we understand ultimately without anyone else below them, it wouldn't mean anything. As Hitler very, as he, the thought he very clearly gives Hitler is without his nation, he is nothing. And the nation is the people who carry out those orders. Without them, there is no Hitler, there is no Stalin. Um, their their own power is, is even, even, at its, even at its height, Stalin... Well, now at the height of his power, with the the war clearly going their way, as the te- te- as the the text suggests, we understand by this ending uh, once again that that power entirely rests on the people below, and without them, there is nothing. Yeah, and then there's obviously the sort of reductive point to make on the idea that history is is written by the victors, which I think is a sentiment here that, that is expressed that. Like, uh, you know, if the Soviets were to lose some of these issues that we started the the third part on, would probably have come to light sooner. Um, some of these terrible things that Stalin did, it, he's sort of absolved of them for the time being, because he won, and Soviets won, and for for Hitler, obviously. Not the case. Although I, I again, just I, I don't buy into the, into the idea that that losing is what then gives him the, deteriorating moral state, 
and now he understands that what he did was wrong because he lost the war. You know what I mean? I kind of, I don't know. I struggled with this part personally. Right. Yeah. I think that's that's fair. It it definitely. I I think the strength of the psychologization re- definitely rested on the, the Hitler's first appearance in Stalingrad. Ever since then, it's been a little bit less strong. I mean, maybe there's pulling influence from Tolstoy's depiction of Napoleon in War and Peace here and trying to have a similar sort of place in the story. But I think the thing about Napoleon is that there was, uh, his character actually is, is very, he doesn't exist. He's still almost mythical in his own appearance in that he kind of walks around and gives orders and we have not a ton of insight into his own, his own mind. We, it's a uh, sort of a deconstruction of his place in history, even when he is a character. He still sort of has that kind of greatness, and we're still apart from him throughout War and Peace. Um, even when, you know, the, 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 I think, cult of Napoleon is torn down, um, that is never apparent to Napoleon himself. That Napoleon exists within that framework that, we, um, that Tolstoy is trying to tear down and is never fully pulled out of it in his own time. Yeah. Yeah. It, again, it it wasn't wasn't my my favorite part. Still interesting. Curious to know if if anyone else really liked this part in our in our Discord. Yeah, yeah. It it, it caused some discussion, so it's 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 sitting in people's minds. Let's say that for sure. Yeah, I feel like that really covered everything we wanted to talk about today. Unless there's any last points you wanted to touch on. No, I'm I'm out. All right. That makes sense. I got nothing else to say. Done ever. forever. This, this is the end of the podcast. Done forever. That's, that's the announcement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, it. that's it. Well, before we completely wrap up forever, um, this is a theoretical now, but if we were to have another podcast episode, what would we be tackling next time? Well, considering that it's the first week of the month during the Life and Fate series, I think next week, theoretically, of course, we would be doing an office hours episode so no reading assigned that's fortunate but you do have to show up attendance is mandatory it is mandatory yeah. <laughs> yeah. um yeah so two oh, yep. <laughs> i can do it <laughs> do help give our show independent and for exclusive access to notes containing all the research that went into this episode head on over to our website saviclitpod.com before we let you go, we want to extend a sincere thank you to all of our current supporters. Camille, Emma, Lauren, Erica, Michelle, Juliana, Diane, Oleg, John, Timex, Melissa, Baron, Aldo, Ben, Gabe, George, Claire, Amy, Ali, Soraya, Jackson, Molly, Emma, Mike, Marianne, Mickey, Eric, Reagan, Mike, Peter, Eric, Ben, Claire, Jeff, Inez, Mai, Robert, Joseph, Daniel, Lou, Nina, Gary, Janice, Mary, Anne, Isaac, Emily, Amanda, Caitlin, Yitza, Irini, and Pakrob. The music used in this episode was Starai Kino by Paramotka. You can find more of their stuff on Bandcamp or Spotify. The links and spelling are in the show notes. You'll hear from us again soon. 